everyone. Welcome back. So today we have uh, another speaker for you in this lecture series. Um, over the fa past few weeks, we've heard from experts on a wide variety of topics. Last week, we heard about from Karen Schmaus, uh, who, was, who is an advocate for the littlest victims, the children. Before that, we heard from Dr. Eric Handler about uh, food insecurity. So we're gonna continue this kind of topic, um, except who advocates for the voiceless? Animals. So I'm excited to introduce to you our next speaker, Mrs. Debbie Plughouse. And so just a really quick background about her. Um, she was appointed as the major crimes deputy at the West Valley Division of the San Bernardino District Attorney's Office. Um, she, is, uh, she was awarded the Humane Law uh, Enforcement Award by the Humane Society of the United States in Washington, D.C. for her work and prosecution of the Hallmark case. And so she uh, also, uh, Debbie was recently appointed as a board member in the Inland, Inland Valley Humane Society and SPCA located in Pomona, California. So I'm very pleased to present Debbie Plughaus. Thank you, thank you, Laura, thank you, thank you, okay. Thank you everyone and thank you so much for being here and uh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited and I hope you enjoy my speech. I'm going to try and um, my presentation is going to be regarding animals, animal law and the humane treatment of animals that we try to provide at the DA's office. So just a little bit about me. Let's see here. I am currently, as Laura just said, I'm currently assigned to the DA's office. I've been with the DA's office for about 22 years now. I'm currently assigned to the Major Crimes Division. However, prior to that, we started in 2016, our office started the Animal Cruelty Unit. And at that time, we were the only, the second DA's office to actually have an Animal Cruelty Unit that was designed solely for the prosecution of animal cases. And really, even though I'm in the major crimes division now, the animal cases was, that's my true passion. I, even to this day, I miss my animal cases. And as a DA, I can tell you that nothing gets the public more outraged than an animal cruelty case. You can have a situation where somebody has raped and murdered and killed multiple people and the public's like, oh gosh, that's awful. But boy, you have somebody that harms a puppy or kicks a puppy and it's videotaped and it's released, the public is outraged, and rightfully so. We have gotten emails. Uh, there was one particular case where, in fact, a puppy was kicked and it was videotaped. We got received emails from as far as Australia demanding prosecution. And I think it's because for we can all relate to animals, right? We, most of us have animals, or we've been around animals throughout our lives, and we can, we can see that that animal that's being abused, we can relate that to our own animals. Because in, for most of us, those of us that have animals, we certainly consider animals to be members of our family. So I'm going to start my presentation with just a few statistics and just to kind of reiterate my point, how important animals are to us, both individually and both as a, as a society. So 67 of our American households have animals. And that is up about 10% from 1988 when the, um, when the survey was first taken. About 10%. It's the, uh, 1988, the percentage was 56%. And now, in today's society, this is the most recent survey, is 67% in 80 million families. So what do you guys think is the most popular animal in our households? Dogs, right? That's pretty easy. Next, cats. Okay, now this is where it gets tricky. What do you guys think is next? Birds, small animals, fish. Who said fish? Not you. Fish? <laughs> You've seen this, you know. Fish, right? Freshwater fish. 
Then next we have birds, right? Small animals, which would be um, hamsters. And then finally, oh, reptiles, snakes, lizards. That's kind of the new thing for the younger kids, the younger boys. And then finally, horses. So, which I thought was kind of odd because horses was at the end of the list. And money, right? Animals are big money business. I mean, those of us that have animals, we know how much we spend on our animals. We spend money on food, boarding, vet bills. I mean, now we're getting the teeth cleaned of our animals. Um, the other day, I was, we were at work, and the, the therapy dogs had her nails painted. So it gets, <laughs> right? So now they're going to the spas. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, this is an article that I love so much. This is an article I took from a paper years ago in Ireland, and it's about Mr. Sherwood who pushes his dog around when, it, when they get going up the hill, Tiny gets tired, so he gets out of his wheelchair and he pushes Tiny, Tiny up the hill up in Ireland. And the reason why I like this article so much and I use it in my presentations is it just goes to show the love of animals is universal, right? Whether you're in Ireland or Irvine, south of France, south, southern California, we all love our animals. All right, so why should we be concerned as a society against animal abuse? I'm standing in front of my slides, right? Why should we care? Well, it is a common characteristic. It's not an absolute characteristic, but it's certainly a common characteristic of serial killers. And I just added Nicholas Cruz, and I'm not sure if you guys recognize his name. He is the Stoneman Douglas shooter that uh, it was about two years ago. He shot at the high school in Florida, killed 17 people. He was known prior to that, and that was, this was a big outrage, he was known prior to that to posting on social media abusing animals. And everybody came out afterwards, well see, here you go, right, this person is dangerous. And if I remember correctly, he was um, catching cats and putting them in, cage, in uh, boxes and then shooting arrows at them so they couldn't escape. And the idea is, is that people that do this to animals that can't protect themselves, they're dangerous, right? And again, it's not an absolute characteristic, animal cruelty, but it certainly is a common characteristic. And then this is a quote. Again, it's people that do this are going to, generally speaking, go on to more serious crimes. And that brings us next to the link. And the link is something that I deal a lot with in my uh, field at the DA's office, especially when I was in the animal cruelty unit. And the idea is that the link is animal cruelty is linked with elder abuse, it's linked with domestic violence, it's linked with animal, or child endangerment, child cruelty charges. So in other words, you've had situations where you have a child that's abused and the animals are also abused. Or you have a situation where perhaps it's a domestic violence issue where the violence person, the violent, the, we'll call him the defendant, is abusing the animal to get back at the partner. It's a cycle of violence. And a lot of times you'll say, um, we, I went to a training not too long ago that said really the animals are the window into the, what's going on in the home. So for example, sometimes people will take their animals to a vet with a broken leg or whatnot, as opposed to taking a wife who gets beat is not gonna be as willing to go to the doctor because she's gonna be asked what happened. But if you take the animal to the vet, right, they say sometimes the vets are actually the first responders to what's going on in the homes because in most cases, people are gonna be more likely to take their animals to a, to a vet as opposed to a female or the a person that's being abused to go to the doctor and say, I got hit in the face. So what's super cool with this is if the FBI is actually realizing that animal cruelty crimes is something that's serious and that we need to, as a society, start to 
monitor that situation. And as of 2016, the FBI began to collect statistics on animal cruelty crimes and began actually just began a, a database, much like our rap sheets are. So if you get stopped or something, it's actually a, da a database with animal cruelty crimes. Now the only problem is, is it's relatively new. It's only been active since 2016, which is about four years. And only a third of our law enforcement agencies are reporting. So patterns are still emerging, and the more law enforcement agencies that get on board, the more we're going to be able to keep better statistics of people that abuse animals and what we can do about that to prevent that from happening. OK, so this first case I'm going to tell you about, it actually is a great representation of the link. And this is a case I believe I prosecuted back in 2011. And I can tell you with great honesty that even as I stand before you today, this case still haunts me. It still upsets me. And basically, it was a case in Fontana. It was a puppy that looked very much like these little guys. And it was the Lopez family, Lorena, Victor, and their three little boys. And what happened was, uh, one night, the boys were screaming hysterically, and it was the neighbors who called the police. It wasn't the, the Lopez family. Police arrived. The little boy answers the door. He's crying. He says, Daddy killed our puppy, picked it up, and slammed it into the sliding glass window, and they had it in a little shoebox. Yeah. So to make a long story short, we arrested him. We charged him with um, the animal cruelty, the felony animal cruelty for killing the puppy and three counts of child endangerment. And because it's a felony, we have to put on what we call a preliminary hearing. And that's just basically a very basic hearing that I have to show enough evidence I can proceed. So I put the preliminary hearing on and I called the oldest son, who I believe was 10 at the time. And it was awful, right? Because he had to get up there and testify against his dad and whatnot. Eventually, we ended up getting past the preliminary hearing. It was set for trial. And the case continued for about a year. And when it continued for about a year, we would make appearances about monthly. And Mrs. Lopez, Lorena Lopez, she was actually a nurse. She had to come to court every time. I had her come to court every time. And every time she'd come to court, and she'd say, please, please give my husband a chance. Don't make my boys testify against their dad. And she would bring me their um, report cards to show. She was, again, a nurse, and she was working all night and most of the day. And she said that my, that my husband, their dad, he is the one that's, in, you know, he takes great care of them. Look at their good grades. He just had a bad day. He's trying. Please, please, you know, you're ruining our family. And we had victim witness go out to try and talk to her just to see if there was something else going on. And, you know, she, again, she's a nurse. So she's, she's very eloquent and she was very persuasive. He just had a bad day. So fine. I gave him a misdemeanor. Within one year, Lorena Lopez goes missing. This is the facts. Good. She goes missing. I, uh, the case was settled on, I think it was February 12th of 2012 is when I gave him the misdemeanor. Almost one year later, she goes missing. She's strangled and bloodied and dumped in a cow field in Chino with the cows. And he did it. He was admitted to it, said he, she was going to leave him, and he killed her. Didn't think twice about it. So now those little boys don't have a mom or a dad. And he was prosecuted by another member of my office. He was convicted of 26 to life, and he's currently in prison. So again, that just, that's a primary example of the link and why we should all be concerned as society when these cases happen, that it's just not an animal. It's just not, you know, somebody having a bad day. It's something that's obviously much more serious. And again, this case will always haunt me. So, okay, moving on. We should all care about animal cruelty cases. So now let's, let's transition and let's get into animals and why animals, the, why we, why we should humanely treat animals in the court system. So I brought my animal cruelty book, and 
These are all the cruelty laws in California, and as you can see, there's quite a bit of them. I am going to uh, break this down and put three categories of our laws. Now, in most cases, what I looked at when, when I would file a case, I would look at, number one, what's the animal, the condition of the animal, and what do we humanely do to that animal? Do we, do we keep it? Do we try and rehabilitate it unless it has horrible injuries? And then, in most cases, they would have to be humanely put down. And that was always so upsetting to juries and stuff. But the problem is, is you cannot allow an animal to suffer. You have to do what's right for the animal. So that was the one, the one avenue I would always look at. The second avenue I would always look at is the conduct of the defendant. That's in regards to the animal cruelty laws. So basically, there's three main, cater three main categories. We have animal cruelty, which is just as it sounds. It would be maiming, mutilating, torturing, or wounding a living animal or anything that would cause unnecessary suffering. So it's your greater crimes, it's your, it's your killing, it's your stabbing, it's your intentionally starving to death. And then there's animal neglect, which is a lesser crime, and it's more of not providing uh, proper care. It's proper care and treatment. So in situations that you would have um, something like uh, we would get a lot of cases with cocker spaniels. I don't know, uh, you know, animals that have to be groomed, and people wouldn't groom them. So, and again, I'm just using a cocker spaniel as an example. So what would happen is they would get so matted throughout their body, including their, their bottom area, where they couldn't go to the bathroom. Because the fur would mat up, and they would get impacted, and it would be horrible. In some cases, they would die, and they would suffer. So that would be a situation where you would have an animal neglect situation, because it's just, just being stupid, right, being neglectful. Those are um, animal neglect cases are misdemeanors. With animal cruelty, they can be charged what we call a wobbler. It can be a felony or for a felony or a misdemeanor. And then of course you have animal fighting, which I'm going to talk to you about here in a minute. There's dog fighting cases and there's cock fighting cases. The cool thing with dog fighting, and it's actually through the Michael Vick situation that we all heard about, right, with the publicity that all, all of that got, uh, at dog fighting is a straight felony, which is super cool for, the, for prosecutors. Cock fighting is a felony if it's your second conviction. <clears throat> with any animal cruelty case, any animal cruelty charge, it's mandatory counseling. And the problem is, is there's really, it's difficult to find counseling that deals just with animal cruelty. You'll, when I was doing the cases, we would either send our defendants to domestic violence classes to help deal with their anger, or maybe child endangerment classes. But to find a, a counseling system that deals just strictly with animal cruelty cases, it's very difficult. Additionally, and I didn't add this slide, but there is a recent law within the last, I think, five years that if you are convicted of certain animal cruelty crimes, you cannot be around animals, own them, possess them for five years. If you're convicted of a felony, it's 10 years. You can now include your pets in protective orders. So if you have a situation where you have a temporary restraining order, you can now include your pet in that. So it can be yourself and Molly, your dog, or Shane, your horse, whatever. You can add your, your, your animals onto your protective orders. That's a new family law code. Whoops. <clears throat> so just generally recapping, right? And this isn't necessarily the link, but animal cruelty cases are important to us as a society for the reasons which we've already talked about. And in most cases, you are going to have additional crimes. You're going to have prostitution, especially with your cockfighting cases. You're going to have gang activities, gambling, weapons, child endangerment. Okay, that's kind of that Lopez case that I explained to you about. And then, of course, city code violations. So it's just not an animal case, right? It's other stuff, too. Okay, so case one, this is the case that Laura told you all about. This is Hallmark, and this is probably one of the most famous cases, I think, for our office in particular. And it was um, 
there was Hallmark Food Processing located in Chino, and they're now cl closed down. But back, back when this case occurred, what they were doing is there were cows that were downed, probably from mad, mad cow disease, and they couldn't walk, so they were forcing them up what we call the kill chutes, and what they were doing is they were prodding them with the electric prods, and these cows, they couldn't walk, right? They were struggling to go up the, the chutes, and the, the guys are poking them, and they're screaming in terror and whatnot, and it was, under, it was filmed undercover by the Humane Society. And we ended up prosecuting the two workers and the problem with that was the workers, you know, they're just like, look, we're just doing what we were told to do, which is true to a certain degree, but however, they do have um, some degree of culpability. And we actually made Time Magazine, so that was pretty cool, with George Clooney. <laughs> and then <laughs> they, they had a little article. And what was kind of unique about the Hallmark case is even like the meat eaters, right? The, the, the we like our hamburger meat guys were on, were on the DA's office side because the problem is, is the, the meat that was coming from Hallmark, the cows, was actually going to the school lunch systems. So even people that were not animal people, right? They were still off offended and affected by, they didn't want their children eating this this meat, right, that you didn't know why the animals were sick. Because the only really way to do it would be to have the cow euthanize, perform a necropsy, and then actually cut open its brain, right, and figure out what's causing the mad cow disease. But, and rumor was, we could never prove it, but rumor was a portion of the meat was actually going to McDonald's. So we were kind of hoping that that would come out too, because then we get all those McDonald fans on our side. But didn't, it didn't, we could never link at McDonald's, but it definitely was going to school lunches. So it was a pretty big deal back then. Now I do have one of the videos. I don't have the video of them making the cow go up the kill chute because it's kind of, it's, it's an awful video. But in this video that you're going to see, it's one of the undercover videos. And we did actually prosecute the guy that puts the cow in the, um, in the tractor. So you're gonna see that here. Whoops, what happened? Do I just hit it one more time? There we go. It's kind of hard to see, but um, there's a cow in this, in the, the top. You can see it's kind of, right, she's kind of fluttering around there. She can't walk. It's a neurological issue. So in this truck that you're going to see her being dumped in in a minute are all the dead cows that had died in the morning. So she's going off to the rendering service, but the problem is she's still alive. And you can see her legs, she's clearly moving.
So off she went again to the rendering service, or the rendering, um, let me go back here, to the rendering where they kind of, you know, they grind up the dead animals and they use it for fertilizer or whatever. But again, the problem was that she was still alive. So, and when we played that in court, the defense attorney's argument, well, what's the big deal? She was going to be killed anyway, which obviously doesn't go very well in front of a jury and... It actually didn't go well in front of me. It was actually very offensive. But in any event, that, that may be true, but you still, we still have to treat our animals humanely, right? Even though they're going to slaughter or whatever, we still have to treat them in a humane man manner. And animals that can't walk up the kill shoots, there's a reason why they can't do that. And again, it's not only an animal cruelty issue, it's also a, sa a safety issue. So this was a big deal. The feds ended up getting involved, and they actually shut down the um, hallmark. And I think it's now, it's, it's still, a, it's still a, a slaughterhouse, but I think it's under a different name. But again, it was a huge deal. It was a big deal because um, of all the, the pounds of beef that was recalled. And then we were more concerned with the animal aspect of it. And then the feds were trying to come in, and they're like, well, we're worried about the food. We don't care about the animals. And... We ended up getting a conviction of both guys, and um, they went to jail, and uh, who knows what they're doing now. Hopefully, they're not working with animals. Okay. Okay, so the second case is actually a case I'm currently prosecuting. I'm actually in trial with it right now, and we were just doing motions on it yesterday. <clears throat> and the picture is a little bit graphic, so hopefully... Well, the next one is. So this is um, Nick Calderon, and as you can see, he's very colorfully has um, tattoos on his arms. Throughout his body, those are all gang tattoos. And him and his brother, 2016, are walking down the streets in Colton. There is a woman who has two pit bull dogs. They're just not even causing any trouble. They're barking through a fence. He reaches in and he, they're barking at him and his brother. He reaches in and he slices the one neck and then walks over to the other dog and slices the other neck. Now the dogs live, okay? That's not the, the dogs totally live. The pictures are awful. Um, the, what happens is the dogs were barking, all of a sudden they yelp, yelp, right? And then they run back to the house Well, they're just dragging blood area everywhere. So the pictures are awful. It looks like a, like a murder scene but the dogs end up surviving. And what happens is they're caught a couple of blocks later by Colton police, and they, the, they, the officer says, hey, what are you guys doing here? He says, oh, is this about the dogs? And the guy's like, what dogs? The officer, and he's like, well, the dog's up the street. The, the officers had none about the crime yet. So in his pocket is a knife, and it's got blood on it. And we actually have it analyzed. And this is what's interesting, right? This is where the CSI aspect hasn't caught up to the criminal aspect. The, the substance on the knife is, in fact, blood, but it's not human blood. Now, my response to that, to my uh, CSI person, well, the only things that bleed, right, are animals or humans. So if it's blood, and we know it's not human blood, then it has, has to be animal blood. But there is not a test they can absolutely detect that as of now that I know of. So that's a little bit frustrating. But anyway, we find the knife. It has blood on it, but it's not human blood. And they are arrested. They go to court. The judge says, oh, it's just an animal case. You guys are released what we call OR on your own recognizance. No bail or anything. While my criminal case is pending. About a month, a month later, so they've only been out a month, he is, Nick and his brother David are in San Bernardino late at night at a um, gas station. My victim walks up to him, gives him a dirty look, he walks away, doesn't even think twice about it, right? They chase him and his brother chase him down up the street, like chase him. Stalk him and chase him. Stab him multiple times in his neck, 12 times, and one stab wound is this, the figure of what my coroner is describing, a C, 
which I'm going to argue to my jury, it's Calderon is their last name. So he's marking them, right? Stabs them in the sea. And this is, I put this slide up here because you have these, these people, I'm not even going to call them a psychologist, that think that it's okay, sometimes, it's okay sometimes to abuse animals, right? It's just normal behavior. But it's not normal behavior. Okay, there's Michael Reyes, stabbed 12 times. There's my dog, one of my dogs. Now, the dogs lived, and they were stabbed also, coincidentally, right? Michael Reyes did not survive. And I would love to have somebody tell Michael Reyes' mom that it's just normal behavior to abuse an animal. Oops. So these are horses. I'm partial to horses. <clears throat> Chino. Uh, this was an anonymous call that came in. It was a lady that would drive this area in Chino every day, and she finally calls our office, and we, we have investigators that are specifically assigned to animal cruelty cases, and she's like, hey, there's some horses down in Chino. They're really thin. So we go out and we look, and that's what we see. I mean, that's, I don't know if anybody has horses here, but obviously that's, that's really thin, right? <clears throat> and this is what they were feeding them. And again, anybody horse people here? Well, you don't feed horses this. You can't, right? And this is rotted food. It's, I, think what, I think what they were doing is they were getting the leftover food from the, um, the local supermarkets you know, that they throw away and getting them out of the trash bins and then feeding them to the horses. This smelled awful. It was awful. And this is what the horses were eating. This is a different location. This is a cow that had died, and they just left it there. So... The horse is eating straw again. Those of you that have or that know, you can't feed a horse this, right? It's not nutrition, and it's that's why they're so thin. That even though they're eating, they're not getting nutrition, so they're that they're, they're not they're not getting food. And then there was some this rotted corn that we found on scene. And then this horse again, the same location. If you can see right here, okay, I have a pointer, right, right there. Her leg was actually broken. And she was walking around on it. And when she'd walk, her, her like, leg would flip around. Like, it'd be, so it'd be like us walking, I guess, maybe on our ankle bone and our, and our, heel, and our uh, foot just flopping around. So the vet came out on the scene and immediately euthanized her on scene. It was awful because she was, she, I think at that point, she was in so much pain, she couldn't even, like, it, it, she was just, her nerves had completely dislocated from her body. But this would be an example of, you know, felony animal cruelty, right? Causing unnecessary suffering. It's not intentionally maiming or torturing an animal, but it's being, it's causing unnecessary suffering. It's being stupid, right? Because you, anybody can tell by just looking at that, that that horse has a broken leg. It doesn't take a vet to do that. And the guy was like, well, I was going to get it taken care of. So this is a Chino or Ontario cockfighting case, and at the time, this was the largest cockfighting case that was in the country. It was over 5,000 birds, and as you can see, it's multiple locations. It was a, it actually was in Ontario. It was in the dairy locations, and because it was such a large location, what we actually had to do was we had to zone it off. So it's, it's kind of difficult to tell, but each plot of land has a little bit different characteristics, and that's because it's one person owned the whole property, and what he did was he sublet it to the, each individual owners of the cockfighting. And in this area right here, this is actually where the ring was located. And, you, 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 and the reason why it's covered is because, right, so because if somebody flies over, the helicopter flew over and took this picture for us, you wouldn't be able to see it. But these individual blue things are barrels where each bird would be housed. And some were more elaborate than others. There was one of them we called the penthouse suite, which was this area right here, because each barrel had a nice palm tree next to it to kind of shade the birds. So... 
This was, this was a huge operation. Now, unfortunately, we only maybe got five guys out of it because there was a cockfight in progress, which is what Ontario PD rolled up on. But the problem is, is they rolled up, it must have been here on this side, and over here, you don't see it, but there's another parking lot over here, there was a gate. So when they, the officer walks in, he's like, oh, what's going on? And then all the scatterers are coming out this way. So, I mean, we only got, I think I said five, and that's only because those were the, the guys that couldn't run as fast. But, so, I have a table up here, and afterwards, if you would like to come down and look at it, there's some, some cockfighting, what I would call paraphernalia. It's actually illegal. If you find somebody with those items and birds, you can certainly charge them with cockfighting um, paraphernalia. And there's pictures of, there's actual, the paraphernalia is actually there, but I also have pictures, so I can kind of explain it to you while I'm still up on stage. So in this particular cockfighting case, again, it was over 5,000 birds, and those were just the, the male birds. In addition to the male birds, you had multiple females, and what they do is, for example, here you have a female caged with some hens. Each female is caged or is mated with a different male. And the reason why they keep them in these individual cages is they can keep track. It's like a breeding procedure, right? This is big business to cockfighters. These birds are highly valued to them. And it's, it's almost like a business. These are what we call keep boxes. And again, you will find these in a cockfighting operation. During the cockfighting season, which I believe goes November to February, prior to a cockfight, like two weeks before, they will put the male birds that they're going to fight, and they put them in here, and they close this up. And then they'll feed them and give them their vitamins and stuff, but the idea is to, to um, isolate them. They can't move around, and it kind of makes them more aggressive, right, because they're angry because they are in a small cage. So there are, and then when they're ready to get out and fight, then they're ready. It's a conditioning issue. It's a, it's why they, it's the, it's a conditioning. And what, another thing which you'll find is, uh, I think I have another picture. Around these uh, keep boxes, you'll find numerous medications because they are on, almost like a, a boxer, right? They're on a re regimen and they are fed certain times, they're fed certain foods, they're given certain types of vitamins, and it's all documented. So here is an example of a, a ledger as to what birds were fought and what types of medications they were getting. Now this might not look, this is a key piece of evidence in a criminal case for cockfighting because you, what you would do is, as a DA would have an expert come in and explain what each of this means. And again, it's dates and times, weights, and what types of the ounces of their vitamins that they received. And what they'll give them is B12, and we, you know, those of us that take B12, right, it's to give us energy. And what they do is they inject these birds right before the fight during the keep, and it kind of amps them up. These items right here, these are the gaffs, the knives, and I have those in this jar. I've sealed up the jar because they're very sharp. In fact, um, not too long ago, there was a, it was a big case up in Sacramento or Sac San Francisco up north where uh, the cock, this cockfighter was getting ready for a cockfight and the knife actually cut him in his groin area and he bled out and he died on scene. So, ha, oh, too bad. But, um, but my point is, is they're very, very sharp. So, and then you've got, well, you'll see, there's twine here and tape, and that's um, what they do is they affix the knives onto the birds, onto their natural spurs with the twine or the tape. And again, I've got twine. So if you were to go to like a cockfighting case, for example, you see a piece of twine, oh, you know, most of us probably have something similar to that in our own garages. Not a big deal, but in a cockfighting case, it's a, huge, it's a huge deal because it means something. And it would mean something to a jury. Now, earlier when I talked about the other uh, crimes that were involved in animal cruelty cases, okay, here you have an example of weapons. The guys that we found these uh, rifles with, they were felons. So we charged them with felon in possession. 
And this picture I just include because it's interesting because on the property there was one house and in this house there were probably thousands of these chairs, right? Which my argument was those are the chairs that the people sat on when they were watching the cockfight because most of us who live in a single family home don't have thousands of these types of chairs sitting around. So if, when we're done, if you guys would like to come up here and look, there's um, what we call sparring muffs. And you'll look, they look like just little tiny uh, boxing gloves. And those are the gloves that they put on the natural spurs of the birds to practice with them. And that's the idea is that they don't hurt, hurt the other ones as they're fighting. So it's kind of a protection. It's like boxing gloves. Oops. So here's an example of the medications. Uh, you know, cockfighters, they always have the same arguments. Well, I just don't want my birds to get sick, and this is why I have B12. Okay, no, that's, that's not why. You don't, you don't need this type of medication for your normal barnyard animals, right? I mean, this is excessive. There was all kinds of medication. We found syringes and ointments. And then here's some examples of the birds that were on scene. And per, per the case, we had to take, or per evidence, we had to take three pictures of each bird. So as you can imagine how many pictures I had in the case with 5,000 birds, three pictures of each bird. I mean, the judge was like, You're, I, I rolled in with um, notebooks and notebooks of pictures. And he's like, oh my gosh, well, you know, what are we going to do? Don't you just need one? And so, but I couldn't because I had to show each bird. So you will see, first of all, the birds are typically, they're really pretty birds. They're gorgeous. And you will see that their natural spurs are cut off. And the reason is, is because that's what they affix the knives on. Also characteristic is their combs are cut off, normally with a pair of scissors. And their wattles are cut off. And the reason being is these, this organ, their wattle and their combs, it's the, it bleeds. It's, it's, well, it's bleeds. And if a bird is in a cockfight and he gets attacked up there and he has his wattle on, he will bleed and the blood will run down his eyes and he won't be able to see. So that's why they're what we call dubbed. They're trimmed. They're cut. <laughs> So t characteristic, typical characteristics of a cockfighting bird is a male bird, natural spurs trimmed, comb dubbed, and wattle dubbed. And then as you can see here, these, we have to band each one. We put the date, and then we had to zone them off because we had so many different birds. We actually get a, we got a conviction. We actually went to trial on it. We got a conviction, and um, the defendants were just, they were just absolute jerks. They were very difficult to deal with because they didn't think there's anything wrong, right? And it was a lot of work, a lot of work to prosecute, but in the end, as long as you do what's best for the animals, it, it gives me a sense of, you know, accomplishment. So the problem is, is these birds, they all have to be euthanized. And that's, er, er, jurors are always saying, well, gosh, why can't, you know, you use them for food or something or, but you can't because the reason being is they've got all these, in, the, these vitamins injected into them and, and you don't know, right? You don't know what they've had. And they're mean. Most of the time, these, these, uh, these fighting cocks, they are mean and vicious. I mean, you, if you go out to a cockfighting scene, you basically have to wear high boots and um, gloves because they will attack you. They're mean. So... And then here's an example of, we also found there's some more of the, the gaffs, the World Slashers uh, Derby a video, again, um, bands, which they'll use to identify, identify their birds, and then money. We always find lots and lots of money, which where your gambling comes in. So this is a cow case that we did in Chino, and um, this was a guy who was going to the auctions, and all the baby cows that didn't get a do or taken, right, bought, he would, he would buy them for like a dollar apiece. He would take them in Chino and put them in a, a dairy, and if they survived, great. If they didn't, they didn't. 
And the, the problem is, is, I'm not sure if you guys can see, but all this black stuff on her, bugs, right? Flies. And these guys right here, they're dead, and they're full of maggots. They were de decomposing. And the interesting thing is, these, these cows that made it and survived, they were, they were sent to slaughter. Anybody want to know which house they went to? Hallmark, right? They're all connected. I mean, this was awful. So we prosecuted him for felonies, and I think he, he was convicted, and they've since left the area. I think they've gone back east somewhere else. But um, th this is a business to these guys, right? They're just cows. They're going to slaughter anyway. What's the big deal? And it, it was a bunny-making business for him because he'd buy them for a buck and turn around, and if they survived, he'd sell them for a lot more. And it was, it was a profitable business. But, I mean, look at this, look at this poor little thing. She can't see out of her eyes. Her eyes are they're covered with flies. She's got flies all over her. She can't get up and look at her tongue. I mean, that, that's just awful. <clears throat> this was a case that we did. This was a dog that was chained up. And the person that chained her up, Mr. Ibarra, it was like, well, she's always running away, and that's why we have to chain her up. Well, that's fine, okay, but the problem is, is this chain, this was a chain that you would tie an anchor to in a boat. It was a heavy, heavy chain. In fact, I carried it around in my office for a while, and I had to put it in a box and a wheel it around because it was so heavy. And as you can see, it was so heavy, it actually embedded on her neck. She survived, and she found a good home. But, I mean, that's probably an example of what do you guys think? Do you think that's a cruelty or more of a neglect? Yeah, and the reason is, is come on. I mean, anybody can figure it out. You don't put a dog, a chain like that on the type of a dog. I mean, she can't even lift her neck up. And I'm not kidding. It was actually a chain for anchors for a boat. This is Simba, and Simba, we had a challenging issue with Simba because she was really, really mean. But we ended up finding her home. It was difficult, but... She, as you can see her area, right, no food, no water, and she was eating. She was so hungry she had tore up her blanket and was eating her blanket. And you can see how thin she is. You can actually see her body. And on her ears, the flies, we call it fly strike. They were starting to eat her ears. So this was actually a case that... Um, I, I'm surprised that we were able to save her because you can see what horrible condition she was in. And then it, it's, it's, it's unfortunate sometimes because you go through all this effort to save the animals, you get them saved, and then you can't adopt them, right, because they've got their, their mean or behavioral issues. But and she has a happy ending. She has a good, a good story, and that's why I like to include her in here because even though she was in such awful shape, the vets were able to save her. And even though she had some behavioral issues, she was able to find a good home, and it's probably just the way she'd been treated, right? She wasn't a mean dog. She just didn't trust humans because of what she had lived, what her life was like before. So this is Stall Cup, and this is a hoarding issue. And this is feces everywhere. She had dead cats in her uh, refrigerator, and you'll see pictures of that. There's a dead cat. Um, and I think that this is just her general backyard. The problem with prosecuting a hoarder is the, it's a mental issue, right? It's, a, it's I love animals so much, I want to take every animal I can. I don't want the animals to go to the pound because they'll be euthanized, and then you get in over your head, and next thing you know, you have 1,000 cats, and you can't feed 1,000 cats or you get you know, 20 dogs and you can't feed 20 dogs. So it's not earlier when I was telling you that one of the things I look at is the conduct of the defendant. You know, If they're a mean person or if they're just vicious, like for example, Mr. Calderon, right? Or if it's, uh, I'm doing the best I can. So in, in hoarding cases, you have that. You have that, look, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to save all these animals because I don't want them to be euthanized. I'm doing the best I can. 
But when you look at the animal aspect, I mean, these, I don't, I don't think I put any pictures of the animals, but her, her problem was cats. And they were just in awful condition. I mean, they had all kinds of mange, and they were thin, and they weren't being fed. I mean, that, you certainly can't say that that's best for the animals. And in most cases, it's almost better that they're euthanized, right, than to live that type of a life. But the problem is, is a hoarder just cannot control themselves. So it's very, very difficult to prosecute them because even if you get them on felony probation for three years, when they're right off of felony probation, and this is exactly what happened to Sylvia, she was, got, she was on felony probation. The minute she got off, she went right back. So we prosecuted her again. And as far as I know, she's still doing good. But, but you basically, it's, you have to constantly monitor, monitor them. Because they know, well, Sylvia knows, that if, if you've got time hang over their head, they will go to jail. So they know. But the minute you take that restriction off of them, they can't control themselves, and they just go back to their own, their own ways, old ways of, of trying to save everything. They have good intentions, but it's still a criminal act. OK, so where are we going? Well. The good thing is, is animal cases, with the FBI um, taking statistics, animal cases are becoming more noticeable to the public. More people are getting involved with prosecution, and uh, more law enforcement agencies are getting involved. More people are getting involved with t sending tips and whatnot. And no longer do we have this attitude that it's just an animal. HSUS will give $5,000 to anybody who reports a cockfighting or dogfighting. And they do it. They actually do it because, whoops, I keep doing that. Let's go back here. We had a guy, an Ontario guy, he was just Jimmy Galvez, a young kid. I think it says he was 20 years old, just trying to do the right thing. Thinks that his neighbors are having dog fights, and sure enough, he was right. We investigated it, prosecuted it and he got $5,000. So that's him with the Chief of Police of Ontario and getting his $5,000 check. So it's kind of cool. And he's doing the right thing, and he gets rewarded for it. There's new laws that just took into effect January 2020. And again, my point with uh, talking to you about this is every time, if we can just make little small steps, right, we're going to eventually get to where we need. It's just going to take tiny, tiny steps. And we have two new laws in effect that are pretty cool. Um, starting January of 2020, we can now get restitution for um, crimes. People that want to uh, get relocate their pets, they are entitled to up to $2,000 to require that defendant to pay to any cost to relocate or temporarily house a pet. Another. Um, penal code that just went into effect, which I'm super excited about, is sex with animals. And as awful as that sounds, it's actually a, it's a pretty common crime, if you can believe that. Yeah, there's actually, I mean, if you want to get crazy on the internet, you can actually look up stuff, and there's actually groups and whatnot. But prior to 2020, this was the law for sex with animals. Any person who sexually assaults any animal protected under this penal code section for the purpose of arousing or gratifying the sexual desire of a person is guilty of a misdemeanor. So basically, prior to this law, prior to January 2020, if I had a dog that a person was having sex with and that dog was in great condition, right? Karen and I talked about this. I could not prosecute that person for having sex with the dog. Because I had to have an animal that was being abused, an animal that did not have proper care and attention. So I'm going to give you an example of a situation I had. This was in Fontana. This, uh, my anonymous person was looking to buy a house. So he was viewing the house, and he was with his realtor, and he was walking around the house, really liked the house. He walked up the stairs, and he's you know, looking in the big, beautiful um, bay window of the, um, the master suite, and you know, he's looking, he turns, and he looks down the window to his neighbor, his would-be neighbor right next door, 
and he's up high, right, because he's in the two-story, and his neighbor's down below, and his neighbor has Roxy the Rottweiler standing on a chair, and he's having sex with Roxy. And it's all on video. Roxy's standing there, like, well, you know, because she's been conditioned. She's been conditioned. This is normal to her. So the defendant's just, you know, she's looking around. She's looking to play with her little her brother. Her sister was down below, and she's, like, trying to play, and he's got her, and he's, he's just having sex with her. And, well, of course, he didn't buy the house, right? <laughs> he's like, ah. And the realtor's like, oh, my God. So anyway, it was a great video, though, I have to tell you. The problem in that case was I couldn't prosecute him because Roxy was in perfect condition. She was a beautiful dog. She, there was nothing wrong with her. She wasn't being abused in any way. And so, I mean, what did I get? I got nothing. I don't have animal cruelty because dogs have sex themselves, right? I have nothing. So it was very frustrating to me because, I mean, he got, he got Roxy back, and he's like, I don't know, I, you know. And she, like I said, the, we came to find out that she'd probably been conditioned like that since she was a puppy. They had her since she was a puppy. So, but now the law has changed. So now we have, we have, um, I don't have to show that the animal was being abused. I don't have to show that the animal was ba in bad condition. I just have to show why the person was doing it. And obviously in that case, he was doing it for sexual gratification. We can seize the animal. So Roxy had to go back. I couldn't keep her. I had no reason to keep his animal from her. He wasn't being charged with a crime. And in essence, what we do is similar to what we would do a rape kit on a human. We now do a rape kit on an animal. And the animal's forfeited. So again, it's just a small step in the right direction for animal cruelty cases. I mean, obviously, that man that was doing that, he had some serious issues, right? <laughs> to say the least. Okay. Another issue that we're dealing with, and this is more on a shelter issue, shelters are very concerned about uh, their kill rates. In other words, how many animals are euthanized? And the problem becomes that shelters, generally speaking, if they are a no-kill shelter, they're not providing a service to their community. No-kill means they're not helping their community. And what I mean by that is because they have such charged high rates to um, uh, relinquish your animals. They're not adopting out animals. They're putting, or they're, if the animals that they are adopting, the, the rates are outrageous and people can't afford it. There's been a problem lately with people just dumping animals. So, for example, if they call the shelter and the shelter wants, you know, 100 bucks to relinquish a dog that a person can't keep for whatever reasons, they either dump the animal or the animal goes to a hoarder, which we know what happens, right? For, for example, in Sylvia's situation. So there's this new community, or I guess within the community of shelters, it's called the Consciously Sheltering Theory. I think I got that right. Let me. And what it means is that shelters should now be more for the public and doing what's right for the animals, but being a socially, a socially conscious sheltering and being more socially conscious to the public that they serve. In other words, I think I have a quote here. And this is a new, it's a new phenomenon. It's just something that we're talking about at the Humane Society here. Animal shelters' most important responsibility is to prevent the suffering of as many animals as possible. That means adopting socially conscious sheltering policies, taking in all animals without wait listing or fees. So in other words, if you have a family that for whatever reason cannot keep their dog, Take the dog. Don't charge them these incredible amount of fees that they can't pay. Making sound euthanasia decisions, providing low-cost spay neuter services, and helping with pre-surrender and adoption uh, uh, advice. So I, as you know, I just recently got elected to the um, 
uh, the board at the Humane Society, Inland Valley Humane Society in Pomona. And this is something that we are very concerned about. This is, in fact, our, um, our slogan has been getting to zero. Now, because we're at zero, we are getting to zero and staying there. So the great thing about the shelter that I'm involved with is that since October 17th of 2017, no adoptable pet has been euthanized. Now, that's not saying that no pets are euthanized. That's not what that's saying. And in true, true spirit, there is no such thing as a no-kill shelter. I don't care what anyone says. Because you will have an animal sometimes that, come in, that comes in that's been horribly hit by a car, or maybe you have a, a, some type of a dog, whether it be a pit bull or German shepherd, that's just vicious and has bit people. Uh, um, th they have to be euthanized. You just, you have to, you have to do it. And... No, the point is that the shelter, the Inland Valley Humane Society, is no adoptable pet has been euthanized. We have spay and neuter clinics and adoption events, and I'm not involved with any local shelters here, but I'm sure that that is something that's is socially being taken over and what, um, what the kind of the new wave of doing things is. <clears throat> we have clear the, clear the, Clear the pounds or clear the shelters, $20 adoptions. And I think that Orange County also does this. Dogs uh, that are over 40 pounds were over $40. And then we have a pet walk that's coming up. So my point in telling you this and my point in ending the, my presentation with this is not necessarily for Inland Valley Humane Society, but I would encourage you, if you're animal, an animal person like I am, to maybe get involved with your local shelters and to get out there with, you know, helping out. It's kind of fun, maybe one day a week or one day a month, whatever you have available, to your time is, but to kind of get out there and walk the dogs and get involved with the community of helping people, getting the word out to spay and neuter and just kind of making a difference. It's actually not only rewarding for yourself, but it's very rewarding for the animals because really, again, kind of what I began with, right? Animals are very important to us. They're important to us as a community and individually. So hopefully, hopefully we can all make that stride in the right direction and, and help the animals. Right? So that's basically it for me. And I, there's, I have my table up here. Please feel free if you're interested in the cockfighting aspect. There's all the stuff that you can kind of look at if you're interested. So thank you. I don't know, I'm, I'm way ahead of time, huh? We have time okay. So we have time for questions uh, of Debbie. Nikki. And so Nikki. here's our chance to gain a perspective from somebody in the trenches. So uh, just like last week, I really appreciate your insightful questions. This is a time um, where uh, we're gonna bring the microphones around and we have time for your questions. And Gosh. And so, I have a question. Okay. You drew a correlation between um, animal abusers and uh, people abusers. Is there a correlation between uh, men who have sex with animals and pe pedophilia? I don't know of any studies, but my guess is there would be, and I'm going to just tell you from my personal example. That case I was telling you about with Roxy, he had three daughters. And they wanted nothing to do with me, but I, I had information based upon past history at the house that they had claimed that they had been abused by their dad. And he was the same person. Now the reason why they were anti me is not necessarily because of their dad, they wanted Roxy back, right? But in that situation, absolutely, I know, because, and, I, and maybe, maybe the, the girls were older, so I kind of just opine that maybe he started off with them, and now he's at Roxy because they were old enough to fight back. That was my personal opinion. But in that case, I did have information. I had no control over it. They wouldn't help me. They wouldn't cooperate with me, 
because I was trying to get them, look, if he's doing this to you, let me help you because I can prosecute him, right? And they, they, they wanted Roxy back and wanted to be left alone. So, and I, you know, I had no, I couldn't do anything for them. I had to let, I, they got Roxy back and who knows what he's doing with her. Probably the same thing. Because back then I had, I couldn't do anything. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um. Uh, I guess I'm next. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, presentation. It, uh, we did learn things that oh, we good. Did, didn't know. Um, again, you talked about the Hallmark cow situation. Yes. And you said that the two workers went to jail. They did. What happened to the owners of the operation? Well, the owners of the operation, that's where the feds came in. So the feds came in and shut the owners down. I could not prosecute them in any way, criminally, because I had nothing to prosecute them with. The, um, now, of course, the workers, would, the workers, were, telling, the workers were telling the police department, not me, that it was the owners that were making them do that, which was probably true, right? Because these guys needed a job, and they're going to do what they were told. But as far as criminally, I could not prove anything against them. Now, you have to remember, my standards beyond a reasonable doubt. So sure, I'm sure that they had something to do with it, but legally, I could not prosecute them. But to answer your question, the feds went after them and they shut them down and I think they fined them. All the, uh, the, the, the meat, all the costs, they turned around and went after. The guy's name was Donnie Hallmark. They went after him for those costs and they, they stopped his business. So, hi. The la the I've been enjoying your talk. See, in the last year, and in, in this current year, the issue of the horses dying at Santa Anita. Yes. Um, and my question is, because the horses do run, and yeah. so, what is the rate of horses that die from injuries, i.e. Their, their legs break, in wild horses versus such horse events as Jim Canna, where you like run around barrels, mm -hmm. and the horse racing industry in general, and in particular, Santa Anita? Well, the, the, I don't know what the actual rates are. You mean like the percentages? I don't know those numbers. I do know Santa Anita, though. I, I know that the DA's office, right, they, they conducted an investigation, and they found it was nothing criminal going on with the Santa Anita. Now, I, I don't know. I think they're personally, if you ask me, Debbie, as a person, not as a DA, I think that there's something funky going on there, right? Because it hasn't been before Santa Anita's been running for many years, and there weren't this many deaths. So I don't know what's going on. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, people have said that perhaps it's the dirt of the soil. But I think another horse just died last week, right? Mm -hmm. Regarding the Jim Cantor um, issues, there is a culture in, the, the, in Me Mexico, and I can't remember what the name of it is now, but it's tripping, it's horse tripping, right? It's not Jim Cantor, but it's horse tripping. And that's a huge problem that we have in Ontario. And basically what it is is they get the horses in a, um, a circle and they stand in the middle with a lasso and they catch the horse and they pull it and then the horse trips and falls, and it breaks its leg or whatever. Now, I have never prosecuted one of those cases, and the reason being is because we could never catch it. Whenever they were going on, the people would always scatter. Regarding your Jim Cantor situations, I've never prosecuted a case like that before, and I don't know what the actual rate is. With Organized horse events like that, though, I know that um, I think it's food and ag requires a veterinarian to be on scene. So if something were to happen, then the horses would have to, it'd be up to the vet. But as far as a criminal case, the argument would be like, look, this is Jim Cantor, right? This is what we do. You're talking about the barrel racing, right? Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I've never prosecuted a case like that. But I would imagine it happens just by the just by the natural movement of the horses, right? Does that that probably doesn't answer your question? Sure. I 
I know. Well, what do you think? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, you're right. But there's an example, right, of a reputable organization, the organization that you just indicated that you are involved with, right? And you said that they care about their horses. Yeah, so that's an example of a situation where you have a, a, a responsible organization that really wants what's best for the horses and best for the animals. And, and, but then the problem is, is you get these other situations, these other, like, for example, the tripping, right? They have their own organizations, their own organized sports, which they, they, they think, well, that's our sport, that's our culture. But obviously, just by what I told you, it's awful. And I think that, I think that, I don't know, maybe eventually horse racing will be seen like that. I don't know. I mean, the problem is horse racing has been around forever. But I'll tell you that the fact that the horses have been dying as much as they have, it's been getting a lot of bad publicity. And I know, you know, there's people that I know of are like, well, I'm not going to horse racing anymore, right? Because, and then I think it, it's awful, right? They just euthanize them right there on scene. Yeah, so. Hi. Um, I wanted to know about foster parenting for animals. Mm -hmm. I can't afford the fees and the vet bills, but I would love to have an animal, you know. That you could foster. Yeah. Sure. Well, it, we're, is well, there an organization or is there a methodology for doing mm -hmm. that? Well, whoa. oops, I got caught here on my, with, I mean, I, I'm assuming that you live local, right? Okay. I mean. Inland Valley Society in Pomona, I mean, it's in Pomona, I mean, it's, it's probably too far for you to travel, but they have a foster program. I would encourage you, do you have a particular, like, are you partial to a, a particular um, type of dog? Like, for example, I love Cocker Spaniels or German Shepherds. Do you have a particular, or you just like anything? Okay. You could, I would encourage you to contact um, Orange County. Orange County, it's orangecountypetinfo.com. That's your, orange, your local Orange County shelter. And I would also imagine that locally, right, in this area, you have local shelters. Does, does Laguna Beach have a, a does Laguna? That's where they bring animals that are found. Okay. Uh, you, they you, you, you might want to contact them and, and say, you. look. Um, you might want to contact them and say, look, I'm interested in fostering. And I'll also know that there's a lot of organizations that for um, people over a certain age, they have minimal adoption fees. So that might be something you want to look at also. Because now, with That's my question. Okay. Uh, being a dog lover and a owner for most of my life, if I go to a pond or shelter, to get a dog, it's going to cost me between $100 and $200. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's Who's what we're making all this money since this is not, where you put a sign up there for $20, mm -hmm. which is impossible to get? No, well. Why is the price so darn high? I will agree with you. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you this, OK? I, um, I live in Yorba Linda. And I just got my licensing fee for one of my dogs. OK, it was $28. However, I have, what, four weeks to pay it. If I'm one day late, my fee, I have to still pay the $28, and then I'm penalized $48, right? So I'm, that's outrageous to me, and I find that so offensive. So that's kind mm -hmm. of along your same line of lines. You, that's why shelters, remember I put no kill equals no help? That's exactly your arguments and your points is exactly what the problem shelters have. Because you can't go and pay that much money for a, for a, a, a mutt, right? It's crazy. And, and yet you don't want to go to a breeder. So I would agree with you. Now, I don't know locally, but I do know Inland Valley Society, because I, like I said, I'm involved with them. And we do have adoption events that are $20. And we also have, we're big, it's called the Chihuahua Challenge. Well, I don't know if you're into Chihuahuas, but they have a time where, and you can look it up, I don't know if you have access to the internet, but you can look it up where they have, um, you know, Chihuahuas are 20 bucks. And the idea is, you're shaking your head no, but it's, it's true, I'm telling you. I can, I'll give you my information and you can contact me directly and I'm gonna let you know. Are you local here too? Do you live locally? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, Pomona's not that far, 
But I'm going to, when we're done, I'm going to give you my card, and I'm going to tell you, if you find something on at the Pomona shelter, we're going to talk, okay? I might get you a dog before the day's up, but you have to name it Debbie, okay? <laughs> Not... Okay, that's might, might be locally here too, but so I can assure you that's not the case in Inland Valley. I can assure you, and that's what we're getting at. In fact, I can, um, if you're ever interested, if you're ever interested, you can travel up there with me one day and I will gladly give you a, gladly give you a tour of the shelter. I would, I would encourage you to do that. It's actually very fun. But we are building a huge medical center and the big topic is right now is, are we gonna charge fees? for people coming in. No, for low-income people coming in that want to get their dogs spay and neutered, and they come into you and they say, look, I'm, you know, I'm barely making it. I've got my dog here, but I need him to be neutered or, or her to be spayed. Are we going to charge them? And right now, the consensus is we are either going to do a sliding scale, we're not going to charge them. And the idea is because we want to be out there for the community and doing what's right, right? So I can assure you for Inland Valley, which I personally know of, that is our policy. So stick around, I'm gonna get you a dog, okay? I have a question about uh, abandonment of animals. Yes. Um, I'm down here. Where are you? I can't, oh, okay, I'm looking up there in the corner. Uh, <laughs> I'm still thinking about his dog. It, I just wondered, is that a crime? And it is. I mean, we have some, I mean, very large animal, like I, I understand horses are being yep. let loose out in the Norco. wilderness or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, that and, and also exotic animals that mm -hmm. people don't want, are, are those prosecutable yep. kind of mm -hmm. cases as well? The Penal Code, there's actually, there's a specific section for abandonment of animals that you can't do it. A lot of times, I mean, I don't, sometimes if you go up to your vets, like sometimes some of the vets will have the penal code on their, um, their door, right, that says if you abandon an animal, you could be prosecuted for uh, abandonment. I had a case one time, kind of the same situation with the no kill. This lady went to take her, the, the no help, no kill. This lady went to take her animals into the Humane Society, I think it was in San Bernardino, and it was the same thing. It was like 100 bucks to relinquish them. She's like, I don't have the money. She tied them onto the fence, and a coyote came and ate them that night. And it was awful, but you know what? The thing with her, she, w she went to the shelter. The shelter told her no, so she left him at the shelter. So we ended up charging her with abandonment. We didn't charge her with cruelty. We charged her with abandonment. So yes, it is a crime. It is a crime. Now, the problem with the horses in Norco that are running around, you know, kind of if you're going north on the 15, there's that area, you don't know who they're, who they're coming from. You don't know where they've been. Sometimes horses, like, they'll be tattooed right here on their lips, and you might be able to trace them, but you never know who had them. And, you know, horses are big animals, so that's, that's a problem with horses. That, that's been a problem um, quite frequently because hay, for a while their hay was so expensive and people couldn't afford the hay, so they were just leasing their horses. So, Hi, I wanted to... Okay, I can't, the lights are... Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. Uh -huh. And with the um, animal abuse and neglect being so widespread, I'm wondering why it's difficult for offenders to get quality counseling and therapy, as you indicated. And if they do, um, what is the rates of success in them not abusing or neglecting in the future? Well, first of all, they have to have counseling. It's mandatory. And um, there is an, uh, an online course. The only course I know of is called BARC, B-A-R-C, and it's an online course, and it specifically deals with animal cruelty crimes. That's the only course I know of, and there's a lot of requirements for that. You have to have a computer, and you have to log on certain times, and most of these people that, that commit these crimes, they, you know, they just they don't have the access to it. The reason why it doesn't work is, first of all, mo majority of the people that I've dealt with, they don't think they have a problem, so they're not open to change. It's kind of the same thing with sending a domestic violence person to domestic violence counseling. Until they're willing to, until they're willing to admit that they have a problem, they're not, counseling doesn't help. So that is probably the biggest need that we have in animal cruelty cases is to get a counseling system and get something where it's actually monitored. Um, it's just not out there. And what I would do on my cases is probation. Like probation would make the, the, what I, the defendants go to classes. But the problem is, again, what I said, there's not really classes out there. So they, the defendants, basically everybody, probation would just throw up their hands, oh, I don't know what to do, just forget about it. 
So the reason why it doesn't work is because we don't have a, prob a, a program with the count. At least San Bernardino doesn't. Now, I don't know if other counties do, but San Bernardino doesn't have a specific program that's designed that's court authorized. And I'm sorry, what was, it, was that your, what was your other part of your question? Did I answer it? Yes. Okay. We don't, it, it, it doesn't work because we don't have a good program. Hopefully, right, we're going to get there eventually. All right. Well, I want to thank Debbie Ploghouse. I'm really early. Talk. And what we'll do, look for my email, my follow-up email. I'm going to give you some links. Um, we'll, we'll look at some links together for those of you who are interested in helping and adopting out animals who deserve a good home from you. I hope this was an informative talk. We're going to be here for a little bit if you want to take a look at the table. And I also wanted to uh, give you an advance uh, about next week. We have one more week before spring break, and we're going to welcome Eileen Padberg. And she's gonna, it, the talk is out of my lane, my 22 months in Iraq. And it's going to be a little change of pace. We're going to get her perspective. I'm really looking forward to that talk. And look for my email. And so feel free to stay. We have still a little bit of time if you want to come up and meet, meet Debbie. Uh, take a look at these artifacts. And have a wonderful week.